Hi, welcome to Amperd Advocacy Media. This is the Journey Series video podcast. I'm Mark, a brown man with black and white beard. I'm bald. Today I'm wearing a purple shirt and black glasses. And I'm Crystal. Today I'm wearing a uh, not too shirt with flowers. And I have brown glasses, brown hair, brown eyes, and we're in our home office. And today we have the pleasure of speaking with Jennifer Gassner, who is a blogger and author, and her book is called... <laughs> Jeez, I just, I just had this I in just my off it was, completely. I'm it was, sorry. Um, you, I'll probably slaughter this, Jennifer, but it was something about balance and your journey. Can you, can you yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Hi, Jennifer. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Thanks for um, having me, you, you guys. Repeat the name of your book, maybe? My book is called My Unexpected Life Finding Balance. And my diagnosis. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, my memory works in short spurts sometimes. <laughs> so, uh, and yeah. as we said, we did a recording before this, so we have not eaten. Yeah. And so our energy starts diminishing a lot when we don't eat. Yeah. So. And I, I think I also explained to you that our air went out too. Yeah. So that as well. Like, Not our air, but the air in the <laughs> the air in the well, air conditioner. Actually, say like, but yeah. um, yeah. <laughs> that's that's enough about us. Why don't you tell us a bit about uh, yourself and your journey? Thank you. Uh, so my name is Jennifer Gassner. I originally am from Wisconsin, but I live in San Diego now. I'm a white woman with long blondish hair, brown glasses, and today I'm wearing a orangish reddish shirt. And my book, again, My Unexpected Life, Finding Balance Beyond My Diagnosis, is about uh, my life from the age of 16 through about 28. And I, this is all takes place in the 90s. Um, so I was diagnosed with a disease called Friedrich's ataxia, which you two, I'm sure, uh, at least know of. Yeah. It's, uh, rare and it's genetic. And it's progressive. And so the book really delves into my diagnostic journey up in, in my time in grad school, in college, and the first couple of years of my professional life. I guess, uh, and how I discovered disability culture. So, I go ahead and walk us through what that journey looked like. I mean, uh, tell us a bit about the, how the discovery came about. Well, I had always been a very accident prone as a child. And I started noticing I was having difficulty with my handwriting. 
and holding on to things. And then walking was just becoming more of a chore. And finally, one day, I fell uh, just walking to my uh, car when my mom was picking me up. I was 16, and so from there, we went to the pediatrician, and he suggested I go to a neurologist in our small town. I mean, when I say small town, I don't mean like. A few thousand people. It was like a sixty thousand person city. Um. So we did that. Uh, nothing great came out of it. We ended up going to a different neurologist at the Children's Hospital in Milwaukee. And that's really where he diagnosed everything. And also, keep in mind, this was 1990. So this was before uh, there were any genetic tests they could do. So the doctors relied solely on their diagnostic skills, I guess. So, it wasn't until later, 1999, maybe 2000, when it was genetically confirmed that, um, that I do indeed have Friedrich's ataxia. Wow. Yeah. We we discussed before that yeah, there there wasn't much knowledge or literature or you know, the internet was pretty new. So yeah. there wasn't a lot out there. Um for us or our parents to be able to help us know how to get along in the world or to find other people with the, uh, like symptoms or the same disease or whatever situation diagnosis, you know. Um, and I remember that same sentiment, you know, you're talk, speaking of. And um, I'm sure just like, my mom, your mom dealt with the same thing, you know, of being left out and not really knowing what direction to go and stuff like that. And of course, that led to who we became as adults, you know. Um, and of course, you wrote a book that not only highlights that, but also the other things that we've dealt with in the disability community and specifically with the MA, um, what would you say were the main things that happened that led you to write the book? Mainly it was because I wanted other people to know that they weren't alone that I had also experienced not exactly the same thing but there are probably some similarities between in me and somebody with any disability really it didn't have to be Friedrich's attacks yeah, it could have been you know, anyone with a spinal cord injury or anything can probably relate to some of what I am talking about. But I also 
really just wanted to do something that goes against everything that people are told to expect from somebody with a disability and to be a positive example of what people can do and show that it's okay that we need a little extra help and we have value and we have we are very capable as well i think uh, most people get too caught up on what they see and um uh yeah and they they already have some preconceived notions from their upbringing, uh, which is passed down through generations. And um, yeah, we have what we have now as a society. Yeah. And we were talking before this um, about just collectively being able to come together and say, okay, these were the things that you knew and how you were raised to know disability as, but we're here to tell you that those things are not right. And, um, but we were also talking about that we can't do that if we're, you know, siloing ourselves and in essence competing. But that's how we were taught by leaders in society as a whole, that we have to compete and divide to conquer, right? But that's yes. not how we're gonna succeed and advance in the world, right? As a society. Uh, we have to collectively collaborate to do that. Yes, I I agree. I think, you know, Judy Human was really the pioneer of this idea. Like, we all have to work together. It was the first when the file of war passed, that was a collective movement. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it, it wasn't. You know, okay, over here in this corner, we have the people with MD, and we have the people with CP, and no, everyone was together and she really I think highlighted the value of interdependence which too many of us I included you know it was all about trying to be independent when really no one's really independent right I mean if you depend on a job or whatever it is, you're not, you're interdependent. I think one of the really good things that she did was to not only bring together people of all different disabilities, but also really include other um other minorities or other people that have been um have been excluded that they were included in the movement as well like non-disabled people who have gone through different challenges and not, not having people listen to them that's yeah. it. That's important because uh, 
That's the only way we collectively get ahead. Yes. Because if it's just people with disabilities getting ahead and leaving other people that are not disabled but have the same challenges, if we leave them behind, um, then we're essentially doing to them what was done to us. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I, at this point, you know, I'm still looking at it. I'm still a little, I don't know, I shocked, it seems too much of a, too strong of a word, but I'm, I'm a little, I, I don't quite understand why we haven't gotten back to that point. Mm -hmm. It seems like we're uh, siloing ourselves again, like, oh, you're neurodivergent. You're uh, blind. You, you yeah. know, whatever it is. Yeah. Well, right to yeah, I was talking with someone yesterday um, about the intersectionalities, even if it has nothing to do with disability, there is a lot of that. And yeah. in this particular context, it, it was conversating about a white power wheel thing what's it called again just a wheel a wheel a wheel chart of 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 safety it basically yeah. it it uh covers all the different intersectionalities yeah, yeah. and uh, lets you assess how um, people, how we're kept apart and divided and segregated and kept unsafe by our, yes. or, or how we're more privileged than other people by our different, right. uh, different things. For... While I appreciated the chart, um, I was quickly able to point out that, you know, even though we are white. There's also like, I'm a woman, so are you. Uh, we're disabled, which, you know, could be seen as vulnerability, you know. Yeah. Um, so our experiences doesn't mean that there's the white power dynamic and my experiences don't matter anymore. You know, right, right. Um, so I was explaining to her that I'm saying this chart can be looked at as somewhat ableist or mildly, mildly, mildly ableist, just but but someone else in a different minority group could say the same thing, could say that this chart is sexist, uh, sexist or racist, you know? Right. <laughs> so it wasn't like, I, you know, there was a lot of conversation about it, but it was, and it was so interesting. <laughs> but we need to get away from that instead of, the fighting, like we talked about, it's being able to listen to the experiences of everybody and trying to help equality happen, you know, so that those aren't conversations, you know? Yeah. I think it's useful to a point, like we heard another conversation the other day, um, all these, whether we're talking about this, let's say we're talking about disability, all these diagnoses and definitions 
or whatever definition it is as far as race, gender, sexuality, whatever, right? It might be good for descriptive purposes, informative purposes, but it shouldn't go beyond that. Yeah. Besides just the word, but the word is just something we need to identify what it is, but it should not come with judgment. You know? Yeah. That's a hard this hard thing to yeah. Yeah. Um I was thinking we were talking about the whole uh, thing with Judith Human, and yeah. you had mentioned how, you know, that was something that we need to get back to, and that we've gotten kind of far away from that idea of everyone working together um, in this, in sort of one direction. And you know, a lot of the things that happened at that time, like in the 60s and stuff, we've sort of gotten away from and gotten more divided in some ways. And I think it's like, um, you know, like there have been a lot of issues with like tobacco companies or big corporations or like drug companies and they've had, they've gotten in trouble and had their hands slapped in some way. And so, you know, we've, we've got this impression that the problem has been fixed, right? But what happens is they just, or they catch wind of this problem coming and they go deeper underground. They hide better what they've been doing. So I think what's more likely is that the things happened with like Judith Human getting things going and certain people that have uh, power don't want things to go further. So they put things out there that make us more fearful and make us want to separate and isolate ourselves so they can have more control. That, <laughs> that sounds more reasonable. Yeah, that's an interesting thought, right? And thought of it that way. That uh, is definitely an interesting dynamic. Um, so many people just try to control things and be in power, stay in power, and stuff like that. But they don't know how to do different, and that, and that's continuing to hold so many people down. Yeah, well, maybe, so, that reminds me of a conversation I was having with somebody about um, the regulations in terms of Medicaid, Medicaid and how like it's kind of this continuous cycle of poverty that it forces okay. you you to participate in and you know right away my assumption is oh it it's all intentional and she was like well yeah it's easy to feel that way but perhaps it wasn't, and I did, I heard about, oh, 
gosh, now I'm disgusted because I can't remember which president it was that started Medicaid. Like, uh, his intention really was to help people who were uh, in need. Was it Roosevelt or uh, Eisenhower? Or might have been Eisenhower. I know it wasn't Roosevelt. Um, I, I forget. Know. I forget who it was too. Yeah, yeah. My, we're on the same team there. I have no. I forget. Yeah. So like, yeah, that wasn't really his intention, but that's what it evolved into, which is, you know, sad, <laughs> interesting. Um, was it Lyndon B. Johnson? That's what I was thinking. Because of all the Vietnam veterans? I didn't so want to say it. Yeah, <laughs> I don't. Maybe, I don't. I, You've I given us something to research yes. <laughs> Well, I mean, I've already done it, but I'm just, right now, I can't. Um, yeah, I know. It's, yeah. Um, so, let's do one. <laughs> I don't know. I'm having such a hard time right now. Ah. Just, I'm hungry and tired. And <laughs> yeah. Um. Uh, well, uh, I know one of the, if we can go back and talk a little bit about your episode with Deborah Rue. So one of the things I, uh, you know, I would love to put my hat in the ring in terms of public speaking and it's something that again I kind of I used to really shy away from public speaking because of my voice issues which you too can understand mm -hmm. uh but it's something where I feel like, no, we we need to have some representation out there. So I'd like to get more involved in that. And I'd really like to talk about uh, how disability is portrayed and how we are socialized to think about it uh, really impacts how we react when we're diagnosed or when whatever life event happens and we're disabled. Because in my mind, if disability hadn't been such a scary thing and so negative, mm -hmm. my reaction would have been very different. Very different. And mm -hmm. my parents' reaction yeah. as well. Mm -hmm. And just society as a whole, because it is a ripple effect of, you know, uh, thinking negatively about it and what it represents and stuff like that. And so uh, effectively, but it's also meant the people that are disabled are those things too, and we should not include them in things. And that has hurt the disability community a lot. Yes. And I think uh, one of the other things I had this discussion 
maybe a month ago, somebody asked, well, what, what do you want people to know about Friedrich's ataxia? Well, I mean, beyond the fact that I don't, or that I want them to know that, no, I'm not drunk. <laughs> yeah, let's clear that up yeah. first. Yeah, I, uh, <laughs> I also want them to know that it doesn't completely ruin my life. Like, it's, is it there 24-7? Am I reminded of it every day? Of, you know, of course. <laughs> I am. But that doesn't take away from the other parts of me. Like, Friedrich's attacks is a slice. Right. It's right. not the whole me. And yeah, yeah, when you were mentioning that previously, and I, it, it was, I was where you are right now in kind of questioning, um, do I have what it takes for people going to listen to me because of my speech? And so I did a lot of work and to to be mindful and it also helped that I taught a toddler how to speak and so I had to pronounce in my words a lot and then but when it came to speaking my anxiety because I was going through some internalism tokenism yeah. all those things that you do when you're disabled and um and so I was in a very bad place where I didn't feel good enough to feel like I could make a difference, you know, and especially speaking to crowds, you know, so this for me is huge, you know, and it was kind of funny that you mentioned the Deborah Brew episode because she mentions in there about how well spoken I was and that it was easy for me to spew all this wisdom and stuff like that and it was for me it was very eye-opening because I was like if you had known me two years ago a year and a half ago you would have been a totally different story because what right. she was saying is I'm a lot more confident now in speaking than Mark is. But Mark has some excellent insights into things sometimes, and he spews a lot of his own wisdom. There's sometimes. <laughs> but, <laughs> but um, yeah, people don't realize the kind of things that the disability, even getting over those hurdles of ableism, you know, is a struggle in itself to be able to do what we do, you know. Yeah. So I encourage you though to definitely keep doing what you're doing and helping future generations and this generation be able to uh deal with disability in a more positive light and uh, be able to encourage others to do the same. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. And that's, you know, kind of my goal. I'm, I'm busy promoting this book right now, but it's definitely on my mind to start doing more speaking and things like that in the next coming year. Well, we certainly appreciate you doing that. And I'm sure that it's going to be, we're going to hear a lot more about you in the future. I'm thinking. 
So uh, your book was My Unexpected <laughs> Life, Finding Balance Beyond My Diagnosis, right? Yes. Okay. So do you want to tell people where they can get the book and find out more? They can get the book at Amazon or barnesandnoble.com or basically anywhere they buy books. It wouldn't necessarily uh, be in the physical store, but they could order it for you. And it's also available on I believe Apple Books and Kobo and all the those other platforms as well. And um, if someone wanted to reach you personally, um, would they be able to do that? Do you have a LinkedIn and yeah. stuff like that? I. So my website is jennifergastner.com and that's uh, Jennifer, like the normal spelling, and G-A-S like Sam, and is in Nancy -E -R dot com. And then I am on LinkedIn as Jennifer Gasner. I'm on Instagram, Jenny G. Writer. And uh, Facebook as author Jennifer Gasner. So, uh, okay, I thought of one more question I want to ask you. Okay. Um, so... You being in the FA community, um, I'm, I'd be curious to know how well uh, um, do you know Kyle and Sean? I know both of them fairly well. I've worked with both of them on different things. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. I don't know him extremely well, but yeah, I know so, that. So I could do it, but I'll let you, because you probably know a lot more about it than I do. So they, first of all, we probably need to tell our audience and viewers who Kyle and Sean are and what they have done, their movie and stuff like that in their podcast. Yes. So please do. So Kyle and Sean also have Fredericks Ataxia, and their podcast is Two Disabled Dudes. Mm -hmm. And they, uh, they talk to people mainly within the rare disease community. And also about their personal life. Well, can you talk about so their movie, uh, the the Italian, right? They went from California to the East Coast, yeah. right? To what state? I forget. I I forget to. <laughs> yeah, that was like what? Almost fifteen years ago. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I remember being so inspired by that movie just because they had a taxi and while art yeah. is different, it's still, some of it's the same. And so I was very encouraged by it. And I hope to someday speak with them. But, you know, that hasn't happened yet. So, oh, well, I should connect you guys then. Yeah, yeah. You, don't, you don't have to. I mean, I just I want to get it to do that. That, to happen. that would be, yeah. uh, they'd, they'd love to know that. In fact, they're going to India in a few months. 
to do some ride there. Wow. Yeah. Uh, so I I thought they were going somewhere to another country. I saw a post recently about. So are they already in India or are they going? I think it's in. It might be in June. Oh. I mean, it might even be later. I'm not a hundred percent sure, really. No, that that's fine. I can look it up. Sorry, Kyle. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm sure it's okay with him and and Sean both. I mean, they're really good guys. But um, for what I know, anyway. But um, they are. I really do we appreciate you being on here sure. and talking with us. We had some really insightful conversations. And I know well, a lot of our audiences can be excited to be reading your stuff. Thank you. I appreciate it so much. Anything else? No. All right. So well, have a good evening. Okay, you too. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye. Thanks for watching, guys. And don't forget to encourage, educate, and empower someone today. Bye. Bye.